Okay, I hope everybody had a good weekend. We head back into action potentials. This week's lab is about action potentials. And you should bring your laptops to lab this week because it's a computer-based simulation of action potentials. And we'll simulate changing different um, ion concentrations and gating conditions and things like that in that lab. So you should bring your laptops with you to lab this week and next week. We have two computer-based labs this semester and they're the next two weeks. Okay, this week is membrane potentials and action potentials and 
In another day or two, we'll start talking about skeletal muscle, and next week's lab will be about skeletal muscle and some of the um, actin-myosin interactions, all that kind of stuff. So um, we'll simulate, for lab, we'll do simulations on computers for both of those things. All right, so next two weeks, laptops and lab. If you don't have one, it's not working right now, something like that, we'll work in twos and threes again. So as long as one of you in a partner group has a laptop, you guys will be good. Okay. I know most of you use Macs. You're actually better off having a slow PC for this one, um, for the Action Potential Lab, as weird as that sounds. Okay, so if you have two people in your group and one of you has a Mac and the other one has an old PC, the person with the old PC will be better off this time. Okay, any questions about that or anything else so far? All right, so we talking about action potentials and we're nearly done with that unit. We have a few more things to cover. And when we ended class on Thursday, we were in the middle of talking about something called a refractory period. Refractory periods are a time when if you stimulate the membrane, it will not respond. And we talked about an absolute refractory period, which as the name suggests, indicates that the membrane is absolutely refractory to stimulation. No matter how much you stimulate it, no matter how strongly you stimulate it, it will not respond. Absolutely will not respond. There's also a relative refractory period. And in the relative refractory period, it's unlikely to respond, but with a strong enough stimulus, you can get it to respond. The membrane is unlikely to respond during this time. Under normal physiological conditions, it will not respond during this time. But if you hit it with a high enough stimulus, it can respond. And we started talking about why we have a refractory period. And when I say why, um, I mean what are the mechanisms? What are the mechanisms underlying the refractory period? And just at the end of class, we mentioned two reasons for the absolute refractory period. Number one. During this initial part here, during the depolarization phase, the sodium channels are already open. So when you stimulate that membrane again during that time, you can't add any more sodium channels. They're open already. And then just before we ended class last time, we talked about the second reason for the absolute refractory period and that is that during this repolarization phase, the sodium inactivation gates are closed. The inactivation gates are closed. That means sodium can't move through the channel. And those gates don't open again. They don't reset again until the membrane potential gets all the way down here to minus 70, or resting membrane potential. And that's when they finally reset. So even if you stimulate during that time, the sodium channels aren't going to open because those inactivation gates have them closed. Okay, so those are the two reasons for the absolute refractory period. Now I'm also going to give you two reasons for the relative refractory period. Two reasons for the relative refractory period. During this time, so reason number one, during this time the potassium gates are still open. Which way does potassium move if the potassium channels are open? To the outside, from in to out, right? Okay. But in order in order to have a depolarization. So here, let's just have a membrane, got channels, here's the out, here's the in, okay? Which way do we need charge to move to get a depolarization? Yeah, not a trick question, in, okay? We have charges moving this way, 
but we need the membrane, the inside of the membrane, to become more positive. These are positives. These are K plus moving out during this time, right? So how many sodiums, if we open a channel, how much sodium will be needed to make this positive if we're moving positives out at the same time? More than normal. Does that make sense to everybody? More than normal? So it's possible to get a depolarization, but you need a lot more sodium movement than you normally would to counterbalance the potassiums that are moving out during this time. You would need a lot more sodium inward movement to not only counterbalance, but counterbalance and then overcome the positive charges that are moving out, the potassiums that are moving out. Okay, so that's reason number one for the relative refractory period. Reason number two. What is the membrane potential during this time right here? <coughs> relative to, you don't have to give me a number, but relative to its normal rest, what is it? More negative or lower, okay? How far is it from threshold during this time compared to its normal rest? Farther, closer, no difference? Farther. So in order to get up to threshold and get an action potential, you have to move the membrane potential a longer distance, a further distance, because you're starting out more negative during this time. Notice that the relative refractory period coincides with the hyperpolarization pretty closely. Uh -huh. So I'll repeat what I just said and then go back to what I said earlier. During the relative refractory period, the membrane is more negative than normal resting. This is the hyperpolarization part of the action potential. That means that if you stimulate during this time, it has to move further to get up to threshold than it does under normal resting conditions. To move from minus 70 to minus 55, it has to move 15 millivolts. During this time, it might have to move 20 millivolts. So you've got to move that potential further You've got to have more charge traveling in order to get it all the way up to threshold. And that's reason number two for a relative refractory period. It's possible to do it, but it takes a stronger stimulus than normal to get it to do it. So absolute refractory period. During the first half, sodium channels are open already. During the second half, sodium inactivation gates are closed. Relative refractory period. You need more movement than usual because the potassium gates are open and potassium is moving out. So you would need more sodium than usual to move in to overcome that. And reason number two, the membrane potential has to move further to get to threshold. It's because of the potassium channels being open still. Okay, because remember, where do, if potassium channels are open, where would they like to get the membrane? Negative 90, right? So as long as we leave those potassium channels open, it's going to be keep heading south until it gets to minus 90 if potassium has its way. Yeah, mm -hmm. they are definitely related. Okay, you don't have to write down this number, you don't have to remember this number, but just to give you some scope again, a typical neuron has about one million sodium-potassium pumps. One single cell, about a million sodium-potassium pumps, moving sodium-potassium, can move about 200 million ions per second. Okay. I don't know how many neurons you have in your body, millions. Okay. So you have a lot of stuff going on. Sodium-potassium pumps require what? ATP. Even if you're sleeping, even if you're doing nothing, you need a lot of ATP just to keep things happening in your body. Okay. A lot of other things too, but that's just one of the, one of the things.
I want to move next to something called propagation of the action potential. Propagation. The word conduction is also used sometimes. So if I accidentally slip back and forth between propagation and conduction, or if you see a figure, those two words are synonymous in this case. So far we've been talking about action potentials as an event that happens at a particular spot on the membrane in one particular place. But in order for an action potential to be a way in which neurons move signals, that action potential has to move along an axon. It has to move along a membrane. It can't just stay in that one spot. You have neurons in your body that are up to a meter long. I know you guys are all metrically challenged, but how far is a meter? A little over three feet, right? 39 point something inches. Okay. You have neurons that go from your lower spinal cord down to your feet. That's a long ways to go. So we have to have action potentials move along those neurons. And how does that happen? So they have to be propagated along the neuron. So when we say propagation, that's what we're talking about, the movement along a membrane, or they're conducted along the membrane. Okay, They're propagated or they're conducted along the membrane. So if you look at this figure, hopefully I can help you make sense out of it. At this point on the membrane, we have an action potential happening. That means, okay, that means that we have had positive charges move in, and during the action potential, the inside is actually positive relative to the outside. Notice again over here, extracellular fluid is up above, intracellular fluid is down below this line. So this line represents the cell membrane. During an action potential, we've had all those sodiums move in. We get all the way up to positive 30, roughly, remember? So the inside is now positive relative to the outside. So this is our current action potential. All those sodiums move in, where do they go? What does the laws of diffusion tell you they're, where are they going to go? Where there's less, exactly right. Where is there less? Off to the sides where we haven't had sodium move in. Make sense? Okay. So sodium diffuses laterally or sideways along the inside of the membrane. That's what these arrows show right here. If you have positive charges moving to the inside of the membrane, what's going to happen to the membrane potential? What is it sitting at at rest? What number? minus 70. If we throw some positive charges on the inside, what will happen to that? It will become more positive and maybe all the way up to threshold. And if it gets all the way up to threshold, what happens at that piece of membrane? Sodium gates open. They're voltage operated, remember? Voltage gated. And so now we have an action potential. Sodium gates open and sodium moves in there. So right here, let's just look at this spot. Sodium diffuses laterally or to the side, okay. makes this inside of this membrane more positive, and when it gets up to threshold, it opens the sodium channels in this membrane, and now we have an action potential happening here. We just move that along the membrane. Now there's arrows pointing in both directions for sodium movement, but notice the direction of the action potential movement is only one way. How come? give you a hint. What's going on here where we just had an action potential? Refractory. We're still refractory. Okay. So even though sodium is moving back this way, the membrane is still refractory and it's not going to get an action potential. And so that means that we'll only have action potential in one direction under normal physiological conditions. Now if I took a neuron that was resting Remember I told you last week about Hodgkin and Huxley and how they took neurons out of squids, 
okay? If you took that neuron in your lab and stuck an electrode right in the middle and stimulated it, it could move in both directions because under those conditions, it's not refractory on either side. Does that make sense? But under normal physiological conditions, a neuron gets stimulated on one, one end, and the action potential travels from that end down to the other end in one direction. And it doesn't go backwards again because it's refractory in that area right behind it where it just had an action potential. Okay. Is this all clear or are you guys totally lost? I can't tell when nobody's saying anything. Stan? Because sodium is moving both ways. Sodium, the, the arrows down here, this is what you're talking about, right? So the positive charge that just came in through the membrane, the sodiums, will diffuse to wherever there's less sodium concentration, which means they'll move away from this site in either direction. But the membrane behind here is refractory. So even though sodium is moving there, it's not likely to cause an action potential there. Okay, only ahead of it, only in this direction where the membrane's not refractory, will that movement cause an action potential. Justin? Well, again, the diffusion will move positive charges all over. Okay. We have sodiums move in. They'll move this way, they'll move this way, they'll move this way. They'll move all over now because they're really concentrated here. But their effect will only be felt in one direction. Because behind, we're refractory. We still have potassium channels open. We're still in that hyperpolarization mode. So it's, we're unlikely to have a membrane potential in that area because this region right here is just recovering from the action potential it just had as we move this way along that thing. Go ahead, Stan. What is the two reasons for The two reasons for absolute are that during depolarization we had sodium channels open already, and during repolarization we have inactivation channels of the sodium gates closed, and they can't be opened during that time. Right over, right over here? Yeah. You tell me, what, what's going on here before we have an action potential? It's just, there's... Are there any sodium channels open? No. Are there potassium channels open? Potassium leak channels? Oh. What's causing, what's causing our resting conditions? Okay. So now if we throw some positives on the inside of here, and remember, what's the membrane potential here? Minus 70. Where, where is it minus 70? Inside, relative to the outside. So if we throw some positives in here, what does it do to that minus 70? Makes it more positive. It creeps up to minus 68, minus 66, minus 58, minus 55. All of a sudden, boom, at minus 55, that's the trigger that opens sodium channels. Sodium rushes in, and we have another action potential. Anybody else? Same time as what? Sodium's moving in here, and as soon as it moves in here, it starts moving to the side. Okay. It's a very rapid process. Diffusion's very fast, over short distances anyways, okay. which will become key in just a minute. Something else that we talked about, Gary? So, actually, so it does go to the side for the relative refractory, but it doesn't It goes to the side. Going to the side has nothing to do with the relative refractory. Going to the side has to do just with the rules of diffusion. If there's a lot of sodium here, it's going to move away from here. 
The reason it doesn't cause an action potential back here is because this membrane is refractory. Oh. Wait, so these are all just separate? You can think of these as time periods. What's going on here? Okay, we had an action potential moving along this way. At this exact time, this just had an action potential, so it's still refractory. This has not had an action potential yet, so it's not refractory. So sodium here can have an effect. Sodium here will not have an effect. Okay. This also has to do with propagation of the action potential. Just another way to look at it. Over here we have sodium channels opening, positive charges are moving in. As those positive charges move in, they move to the side. Okay. And as they move to the side in front of the action potential, we stimulate more membranes. And notice as you move from panel A to panel B, okay, a millisecond later, we've moved along the membrane one or two millimeters. And as we continue, two milliseconds, we moved along the membrane a couple more millimeters. Can you talk about myelin and anatomy, all you anatomy people? What does myelin do? Anybody? It's wrapped around axon, and I heard somebody else say key something key. What? It allows the action potential to to travel faster because Kelly, it's it's jumping. Yeah. Okay. So this is what happens. So what we've just been talking about is what happens in a non-myelinated axon or unmyelinated. Okay, so the process up here shows that. Now let me talk about myelin briefly. Myelin is made out of cells called Schwann cells. S-C-H-W-A-N-N. -N. Isn't that the name of those ice cream trucks that come around in some neighborhoods? Schwann, okay. Schwann cells. These are supporting cells. They're cells of the nervous system, but they don't conduct. They're not neurons. They're supporting cells in the nervous system. And they wrap around the neurons. And when they wrap around the neurons, they provide a sort of coating or a sort of insulation, if you will. Let's move on to the next figure. Speak up, Zena. Yes, the myelin sheath is the coating or the insulation around the neuron. Formed, the, the myelin is formed by the Schwann cells wrapping around. Okay, and so what you see here is that we have myelin in certain places. So here, in the sort of brownish color, we have an axon of a neuron. This is the excitable cell. And in the sort of orangey pink color, we have myelin shown. Notice that we have myelin just in certain sections. Spaced at regular intervals, we have a break between the myelin. Anybody remember what those breaks are called? Nodes of Ranvier or Ranvier. Nodes of Ranvier. Those are the spaces in between the myelin where the cell membrane of the neuron is uncovered. It's not insulated at these places. <laughs> and myelinated axons pass or propagate action potentials more rapidly because the action potential jumps from node to node to node. It jumps from here to here to here to here, and so on. 
So axons that are myelinated propagate action potentials much more rapidly. They're much faster. I want to talk about why that is in just a minute, but before we get there, I also want to mention that thicker axons, bigger neurons, thicker axons also move action potentials more rapidly. Larger diameter axons are faster conductors of action potentials. So the fastest neurons in your body are both thick, large in diameter, and myelinated. Your motor neurons, for example, what do I mean when I say the term motor? Yeah, movement. So when I say motor neurons, it's the neurons that are going to your skeletal muscle. Those are both large in diameter and myelinated. They conduct signals rapidly. You have all kinds of internal receptors for different things, temperature and pH and potassium levels and all kinds of different things. Do you think it really matters if your brain gets a signal about the temperature in your liver within a couple of milliseconds? Or could it wait a second or two about a change in temperature in your liver? It can wait a second before it gets that, right? So lots of those sensory neurons that aren't super important that they be really fast are non-myelinated and much smaller. You have, I don't think, do you guys talk about class one and two and three and four neurons and anatomy? I don't think so. Maybe those of you in sports medicine, when you move on to Priscilla's neuroscience and motor control class, I think you'll do more of that. Okay. So I won't go into detail here then about that. All right, so size and myelination, the two main factors that determine the speed of conduction. Kelly? What would move faster, a thicker non-myelinated or a thinner myelinated? Probably a thinner myelinated. But thicker and thinner is a relative term, too, right? So and, and let me just throw a term out there that you don't have to know, but I'm not sure. It might be in the study guide, and the term is cable properties. Cable properties is the reason why it's just a property of thickness and th of um, area and so on about why thicker axons conduct more. And you don't have to know that, so if you see that term in the study guide, just ignore that question about cable properties. Okay. It should make sense to you. Cable properties. Okay. If you if you model the axon as a cable, a thicker cable will carry signals faster too. So it has to do with some physics that goes on in those things. But you don't have to know about it. Alrighty. So we have these spaces with myelin. They're interrupted by the nodes of Ranvier where there is no myelin. Okay. Here we have an action potential where it's green where it says in great big fat letters, action potential now here. Can't miss that, okay? That means that sodium's moving in. Sodium moves in, and what does it do? Diffuses laterally. Thank you, Casey. And what happens when it gets to the next node? Yeah, it brings it up to threshold, and we have an action potential fire here. It turns out for short distances, sodium diffusion is more rapid than having that all that membrane in between have to be depolarized and repolarized and so on. Makes sense? For short distances, up to one to two millimeters roughly, sodium diffusion is much faster than having to depolarize all the membrane in between that space. So if we have myelin here, sodium just diffuses from node to node to node, and we get action potentials jumping. We call that saltatory conduction. Anybody know why we would call it saltatory? If you know Spanish, what's Spanish for jump? Saltar, saltatory. Okay, so saltatory means jumping, saltatory conduction. 
or jumping conduction. So myelinated axons, because sodium is diffusing to the side, have action potentials only at the nodes of Ranvier. So the action potential appears to jump from node to node to node, or we call that saltatory conduction. Justin? I think your question is, why doesn't it just do this even if there's no myelin, right? Why doesn't it just diffuse a couple of millimeters over? I don't know the answer why that is. Somehow the extra sodium coming in changes the properties on the inside if we have no myelin. But where there's myelin, there's no sodium channels in those spots now. And so somehow the sodium moves differently under these conditions than it does if we have sodium channels all along that whole space. And that's as good an answer as I can give you on that one. Zena. Sure, what's happening during depolarization phase? What channels? Sodium channels. And if we open those channels, which way will sodium go? In. So. That results from them receiving that signal, right? We're going to talk about it today, or maybe t maybe won't get be tomorrow. So hang on to that, okay? Our clock doesn't work again, so I'm starting to look to see how much time we have, and it's all messed up. So you guys will have to keep me honest. I have my cell phone up here, but yeah, we might not make it today. It's ten thirty-five already. Okay. Any other questions right now? Okay, then let me briefly talk about two things that aren't in your notes. This was the last figure in your notes. Remember that sometimes I'm going to give you clinical examples or disease examples. So, multiple sclerosis is a disease that results from the breakdown of myelin in neurons in the central nervous system, the CNS. Multiple sclerosis results from the breakdown of myelin along neurons of the central nervous system. The central nervous system is what? Brain spinal, Brain spinal cord, thank you. All right. It's an autoimmune disease. Unsure what triggers it. There's a very small genetic link The term sclerosis comes from the Latin for scarring. So really the name of the disease is multiple scars, if you will, because the scars result where the myelin breaks down all along the axons. When the myelin breaks down, remember we just said there's no sodium channels in the middle there. And somehow again, the diffusion is messed up and we don't have normal signaling. When the myelin breaks down, we don't have normal signaling. And it primarily affects motor function, although it can have other effects. Its onset is gradual. It occurs in women about twice as often as it does in men. Onset is usually somewhere between the ages of 20 and 50. If you've made it to 50 without having it, you're probably not going to get it. Its onset is pretty gradual. It worsens over years and years. P 
people live a little less long than normal people. I think the, uh, the information I, that I see says five to ten years. Life expectancy is five to ten years less than normal individuals. But quality of life is impacted a lot. Most people will lose the ability to walk and other factors. So the quality of life, even though they, they die earlier, but not it's not like it kills you by the time you're 25. But the quality of life is impacted largely. Justin? That's exactly right. And as far as I know, people don't seem to know why that is. So Justin's question is, do you have periods where it's dormant? And the answer is yes. You seem to have periods where it affects you a lot. And then it goes away for a while. And then it comes back. You have another time where it's really bad. And gradually over time, those bad times get worse and worse. And the dormant times get worse and worse. Okay, But you do have, within the progression, you sort of have cycles like that too. You're exactly right. Okay, so that's MS or multiple sclerosis. Probably all of you have heard of that. Probably less of you have heard of the other disease that I want to talk about, which is Guillain-Barre syndrome. How many of you have ever heard of this before? Two or three of you. Okay. Guillain-Barre is also a problem where the myelin breaks down. But notice up here... It's the motor nerves of the peripheral nervous system now. It's not the central nervous system. It's the peripheral nervous system. Notice also the second bullet point up here, rapid onset. Okay? And when I mean rapid, I mean rapid. Like, if I were to get Guillain-Barre right now, I'm walking around normally today. I rode my bike this morning. Two days from now, I wouldn't be able to get out of bed and walk. I would be totally paralyzed. Okay? That's how fast it comes on. It's an, also an autoimmune disease. People are unsure what the trigger is. Sometimes it seems to be triggered by some kind of previous infection sometime in recent, the recent couple of months, but it's really unsure. And most people recover fully although it takes quite a while. You can be paralyzed for a number of months and it takes a lot of physical therapy and a lot of hard work to get back to normal. About 80% of people recover fully. In the worst cases, even your respiratory muscle, remember respiratory muscle is skeletal muscle. And so even respiratory muscle is affected and people have to be on a respirator in order to stay alive. And let me just give you a brief example. Seven years ago, about six and a half years ago right now, I guess, my dad contracted Guillain-Barre. He was retired. My mom had just retired too. They were doing a lot of work for an organization um, through their church. It's kind of like Habitat for Humanity. It wasn't Habitat, although they also do work for Habitat. My dad was an engineer and knows a lot about construction and is a pretty handy guy. So he was doing a lot of work, and my mom was painting and stuff, helping build houses. You guys might remember that about eight or nine or ten years ago, there were big fires in San Diego County. So they were helping rebuild homes in San Diego County for poor people. And all of a sudden, one day, my dad fell a couple of times. By the end of the day, his legs were feeling really weak. The next day, it was worse, and they decided they better leave the job site and go to the doctor. And by that evening... He couldn't walk at all. He was mostly paralyzed. This was in March. Um, sometime in early June, he started to be able to wiggle his toes a tiny little bit again. So he had three months where he couldn't do a thing for himself. Couldn't feed himself, couldn't bathe, couldn't pee, couldn't do anything for himself. Okay? So takes away a little bit of your pride and dignity. He was in a nursing home during that time. And... I told you early June, he started to be able to wiggle his toes a little bit again. Gradually, things started to come back. In early August, he was able to go home with a walker and a wheelchair and things, and gradually he um, got to back to fairly normal function. Now, my dad also has Parkinson's, another neural disease. So it's hard to say whether my dad fully recovered or not because Parkinson's and Guillain-Barre share some of the same symptoms with, um, with motor deficits, muscular deficits, and so on. Um, 
his Parkinson's is pretty slowly progressing, so it doesn't affect his life a whole lot. Um, but if you ever met him, you'd see that he's, you know, you guys know anything about Parkinson's and the tremors, so he definitely has one of those tremors, and so on. Okay, so Guillain-Barre, also a problem with myelin, also an autoimmune disease, just like MS. MS is central nervous system. Guillain-Barre is the motor nerves in the peripheral nervous system. MS is real gradual onset and no cure. Guillain-Barre is rapid onset, but most people eventually recover fully. Both problems with myelin, just to show you some clinical correlations and disease correlations are what we've been talking about here. And therefore, with passing of action potentials down nerves. Okay. Lisa? Uh, sir, what is the onset um, older people, for Guillain-Barre, older people, and by the way, Guillain and Barre are two French physicians who first described this condition, so that's where the name comes from, okay? Um, older people are more likely to get it, but it's not only older people. They're, you know, you can get it in, you can get it your age, you can get it in your 30s. My dad happened to be about, what was he, 71 or 72 or something like that when he got it, um, Okay, Justin? Not very common. I forget the numbers. One in one in 200,000 or something like that will contract it. Something like that, I think. Okay. I had never heard of it before my dad came down with it. And two of you said you had. Okay. Uh, Stephanie? That's not clear either. What is... What was the signal that caused the myelin to get eaten away by your own body? And what is it that stops and allows the myelin to start growing back again? Those things aren't clear. There's a couple of treatments that will maybe lessen the impact. For example, my dad had something, which is one of the two common treatments called plasmapheresis. Basically, they take your plasma out and filter it all to try and get a lot of the, um, the antibodies out that are labeling the myelin as foreign and causing your your immune system to eat away its own cells. Right, it does rebuild, correct. Yeah. It does rebuild myelin eventually. Okay, that is the end of that unit. Let me briefly introduce, that's about all we have time for, the next unit. In the next unit, we'll be talking about synapses. A synapse is the connection between two cells. Usually when we talk about synapse, we're talking about the connection between a neuron and another cell. It could be another neuron, it could be a muscle cell, it could be your heart, it could be whatever. A neuron in some other cell is what we're usually referring to when we talk about a synapse. In this unit, it's not all that long, so we should get through it tomorrow. And the next one is skeletal muscle, so just to let you know if you're printing the handouts and so on. By the end of tomorrow, or for sure by Thursday, you'll need skeletal muscle handout as well. In this unit, we'll answer Zena's question about signaling and how the dendrites receive that and how that causes an action potential and so on. But when we talk about synapse, basically we're talking about how do we get the signal from one cell to the next. When we talked about action potentials, we talked about what happens at a single space on the membrane. We talked about propagation, how do we move that action potential down the membrane. And now we want to know when we get to the end of the cell, how do we get it to the next cell? How do we pass that signal between cells? This particular thing that you have up here probably looks like complete nonsense to you, but some of you may have read the legend underneath already. This is an Egyptian papyrus that describes a brain surgery from the 17th century B.C. Okay, it's the earliest written reference to brain surgeries. What's in the little boxes there where somebody has made little rectangles is uh, the papyrus words for brain. What do you think anesthetics were like in the 17th century BC? How much pain do you think these subjects felt during this surgery? 
I'm imagining they felt pretty much everything. Yeah, I don't think there was much they didn't feel. Okay. So we're talking in the synapse unit about moving signals from one cell to another, and we'll focus on moving s signals from one neuron to another cell. Okay, the neuron's been having an action potential. It moves along and passes that signal to another cell. Let me briefly introduce a couple of terms. You know what, actually, let's just talk about what a neuron looks like, and then we'll end there. Okay? This is your Joe average typical neuron that most books will show some figure like this. Zena already threw out the term dendrites, and that may not be familiar to all of you. Dendrites are all these little spiny looking things on this end. Notice here it says dendritic spines. Okay, the term dendrite is right up here. This end of this neuron is the cell body. And the cell body is also sometimes called the soma, S-O-M-A. The soma, and I don't see that term in this particular figure. The cell body is where the nucleus is. Most of the mitochondria and all the other organelles are up in this area, up in the cell body. And then we have this long cylindrical portion, which is called the axon. I've used that term a few times already, axon. It's this long cylindrical portion of the neuron that we're going to pass the action potential down. And then we get down to the synaptic terminals, the far end. Okay. Remember, the synapse is the connection between two cells. So these are the terminals at the synapse. These are sometimes called axon terminals. You'll see them come in different names. Okay. In a normal neuron, we're going to receive a signal on this end at the dendrites, and we're going to move that signal from this end to this end, and then we're going to go across a synapse to another cell. Notice it's post-synaptic cell, after the synapse cell. Okay. And so that's the basic setup of kind of what we'll be talking about, your average um, dime store neuron here, and we'll talk about that some more tomorrow and how that signaling occurs. <laughs>